Hundreds of athletes from nations around the world made the trek to Turkey, this time to Ankara, a city on the rise that serves as the capital of this historic land. Ruins and ancient artifacts blend into this modern metropolis, serving as a reminder of the Romans, Ottomans, and Hittites who once ruled the day. For one week in March, Ankara was ruled by men and women bearing bows and arrows, all battling for a chance to make their own history. Indoor archery is a super challenge of accuracy. There's no weather, no anything to, to challenge you but the target face. I think it's just the pure form of, of accuracy that you can find. Indoors, we shoot at 18 meters at a three spot vertical face. And the ring is, the inside 10 ring is about the size of a US one cent coin. It just is really tough to do. Okay, the tournament format is 60 arrows to qualify, seating you one through 32. You shoot a 15 arrow match against the guy when number one against 32, and the winner advances where the loser goes home. High pressure and excitement where you stand there right by the guy and see how you're doing. It just is a really nice format to end up all the way down to the number one guy and the world champion. What I love about indoor archery is the head-to-head. -head. You're right there on top of it. The crowds can be right close in and it's just pure accuracy. There's no win, no anything. If you miss, it's your fault. There isn't a lot to go wrong other than you messing up. The American team had a brand new look with Crystal Govan flanked by Mikey McGee and Brogan Williams. They would look to Crystal, who came on the scene just a few years ago herself, as well as real wild in the coach's box. The Italians, led by Irina Francini and Laura Longo, were joined by Eleonora Sarti, a trailblazing archer already bound for the Paralympic Games in Rio. It's a tight one as we pick up the match after three ends, Italy on top by two. Brogan Williams from the state of Oklahoma making a strong debut, driving her shot down the middle. Mikey McGee calls Michigan home and she seemed to feel right at home on the big stage in Ankara. Crystal picked up right where she left off from last year, showing the form that made her the silver medalist of the Outdoor World Championships in Copenhagen. The USA trying to turn up the heat, but Italy stays cool, calm and collected. Sarti sinks a 10-9 liner, Laura Longo's right on the line, and the ladies from Italia hold off the Americans down the stretch, holding on for a one-point victory that will put them on the podium, receiving bronze medals. It's a slim one-point victory made even more memorable by Sarti's performance and the team's decision to place a Paralympic champion on the national able-bodied team. A huge milestone for Sarti, as she became only the second Paralympic female athlete to shoot on Italy's Paralympic team and able-bodied squad. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Italian men would be going for gold. The veterans Sergio Pagni and Luigi Dragoni welcoming a 21-year-old Michele Nencioni onto the team. And he would play a key role in this duel with the Danes, Denmark fielding that powerhouse lineup of Hansen, Dambo, and Larsen. A surprising 55-point first end had the Danes down by two going into the fourth end where Damsbo would lead off. Martin scoring a direct hit. Ten. World champion Stefan Hansen would follow suit. Yeah. And Patrick Larson made it three in a row. Denmark yeah. making a move and applying pressure. But if Sergio Pagna feels pressure, you would never know it. One of the sport's all-time greats comes through in the clutch once again, giving confidence to those who follow in his footsteps. Dragone drills a critical shot down the middle, and Nencioni nails one on the 10-9 line. Italy gives up a point, but does not surrender the lead, which is down to one. With time and arrows dwindling down, Martin Damsbo can only muster up 
a nine. Hansen maintains his hot hand with yet another 10. And the mechanic, Patrick Larson, tries his best to repair the damage of his team's slow start. Denmark still has hope after Nencioni's nine on this shot. Nine. And yet another nine off the bow of Luigi Dragoni. Nine. Not knowing if Nencioni's first shot was in or out, Sergio wasn't about to take any chances. A 10 would guarantee at least a shoot-off, and Sergio backs up that guarantee, coming through in the clutch as he has so many times in his career. At the very least, the two teams are tied. At best, from Italy's perspective, that is, the match is over. The fate of six archers rests in the hands of one man who's judge and jury, and after a closer inspection, the decision goes to the men in blue. Nencioni's shot caught the line, it counts as 10, and so Italy gets to celebrate after a close call in this encounter with Denmark. Martin Damsbo patiently waited for the celebration to die down so he could congratulate his good friend Sergio Pagni and the rest of a very good and talented Italian squad that was solid from start to finish. We haven't won the World Championship since 2003, so we're very happy about that. Good qualification rounds, first in the matches, we're so happy and so proud. After bagging a bronze medal with the Italian team, Irina Francini found herself back in the spotlight, shooting for her very own gold medal at the Indoor World Championships against Albina Laganova. The powerful Russian has been a dominant figure the past decade, but like many others with long careers, she's dealing with aches and pains coming into this match. Still, the score was tied at 57 after the first two ends. Francini, after her first world indoor title, plants her first shot of the third end on the line. A chance for Albina to take advantage, but her arrow ends up in the eight ring. Advantage, Francini, who could be up by two. But just to keep things interesting, she veers off course into the red zone. It's a gift for Albina, who comes up with a better result. After this, 10 by Francini. And another nine by Laganova. Albina gets an even better gift. Irina's first shot was deemed to be a nine, so the score is still tied, 83 all, with six shots to shoot. Fourth end starts with the same story, a 10-9 liner by Francini, leaving everyone in suspense. Laganova left no doubt about her first shot. She could be trailing by one. No drama on Irina's second shot. It's in the sweet spot. Elbina's doing her best to find that same spot, but coming up just a bit short. She could be down by two, and it could be more after Francini finds the middle one more time. With great determination, Loganova wills her third arrow into the 10 spot and will head for the fifth end, only trailing by one. Francini holding a 1-12, 1-11 lead with three in the quiver. Feeling the effects of a sore neck, Albina opens with an eight. That opens the door for Francini. She opens up some daylight, striking goal to move ahead by three. The resolute Russian shows what she's made of, coming back with a 10 to stay in contention. But Francini's got a firm grip on the lead and isn't letting go. 10 more points to put her on the doorstep of a major victory. The kind of win Albina celebrated so many times during her decorated career. But this day belonged to the 34-year-old Italian, who finally caught what she's been chasing for so many years. Irina Francini had won team silver medals at the World Championships way back in 1999 and 2001 in Beijing. But here in Turkey, she goes from being the bridesmaid to being the bride coming off a silver medal this winter on the indoor tour stop in Nîmes. Irina Francini used that as a stepping stone for success at the World Championships in Ankara. The final score, Francini 141, Loganova 138.
The entire week was intense because of the pressure. I was happy about the qualification round because I was first. And today in the final, the pressure was really high. I had some bad shots, some bad arrows, but I was lucky, and I won. The prelude to Loganova's loss had come earlier in a gold medal match where Natalia Avdieva and Maria Vinogradova had teamed up with Albina to try and defeat Denmark's Tanya Jensen, Erika Anir, and Sarah Holst Sonicsen. Those three women were coming off wins over Turkey and the bronze medalists from Italy. Despite some struggles early on, the Danes were still in the hunt, only down by one going into the fourth end. And in that fourth end, Tanya Jensen would jab the nine ring. Not necessarily the start Denmark was hoping for. And Erika Anir, the Australian transplant, could do no better. But Sarah Holst Sonicsen was rock solid. So that gold medal was not out of the question. Still, Denmark's chances didn't look good after Maria's almost automatic 10. But a nine from Natalia, nine. followed up by an eight off Albina's bow, changed the complexion of this match, which was now tied with three arrows to go. Emboldened by the Federation's fall, Tanya tacks on a 10. Anir makes it clear she can come through in the clutch too. But this oh-so-close nine by Sonicsen gives Russia another chance to lock down the goal. Vinogradova on the border between a 9 and a 10 with this shot. Avdieva crosses that border and hits pay dirt. But once again, not knowing the true value of Maria's shot, Albina must assume she needs a 10 to at least force a shoot off. A 9 focused attention on the judge, deciding if the match was over or if there would be a shoot off. Some anxious moments for all six archers that seemed like an eternity. Finally, the verdict is in, and this one is going to a tiebreaker. New life for the Russian Federation, and another challenge for the Danes, who take a one-point lead after the first two shots. So once again, it falls upon Albina to give her team a fighting chance. But a nine leaves something to be desired, and that something belongs to Denmark. Sarah Holst Sonicsen, Tanya Jensen, and Erika Anir were on the edge all throughout this epic battle. But they pulled it together, especially when it meant the most. This time, it's a clear-cut decision. It took 27 arrows, but those last three made a big difference, delivering a major victory and the gold medal to Team Denmark. The real turning point came in the second end when three shots that could have gone either way were all scored tens by the powers that be. And that's what really influenced the outcome of a match that gave Sonicsen, Jensen, and Anir the biggest wins of their careers. A world title in Turkey. Welcome to the 2016 Blind Shooting Challenge. Today we're gonna have two archers competing against each other, but the disadvantage they will have is they will be blindfolded. So they'll be able to draw back their bows, then I will slide this blindfold over their eyes. So today, we have Toya Cerny from Slovenia. Hi. She'll be shooting against her fiance, Brady Ellison from the United States. Okay, we're gonna let you call it. You're gonna call heads or tails? Tails. Tails, okay. Okay, it's tails. Let's get you right here. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> You're gonna need it. <laughs> that should work. Yeah, oh, perfect. That's beautiful. <laughs> It was on the bail. <laughs> You're not in the X, we know that. <laughs> Ooh.
see it? Yeah, it's on the face. I was closer. That's all that matters. I think we should do it again. <laughs> Brady is the winner of the blind challenge. My miss is closer. Yeah, because it's American judge that okay. cheating. <laughs>Bronze medal match, Toya would have Brady in her coach's box and be able to keep both eyes open and on the target. Seems reasonable since her opponent was tough enough. Belgium's Sarah Prios had already gotten the best of Crystal Galvin and Sarah Holst Sonnexen, and she had a slim edge over Toya, who started the fifth end with a nine. Prios put the next shot in about the same spot. But the Slovenian sharpshooter just wasn't as sharp as usual. Turns out, both women were allergic to the center circle. But that would not prove to be fatal for Sarah Preels. After another nine from Toya, Sarah only needs another nine of her own to seal the deal. Consider it sealed. A year before Preels meddled in Marrakesh on the indoor tour in Turkey, it's a big leap for the Belgian, who takes home an indoor world title. It's a slim one-point victory, 140-139. Slovenia would get a second chance at a bronze medal, and that chance belonged to Dejan Sitana, an accomplished veteran on the world stage. Omid Tahiri, a relative unknown, but the 26-year-old Iranian archer had opened a lot of eyes by opening a five-point lead after four ends. In a word, Tahiri was terrific. Another 10 increased his lead to six. That seemed to light a fire under Sitar, who answered with a 10 of his own. Tahiri? Comes back with a 10 9 liner. Probably nine. Back to Dayan, and it's deja vu all over again. Back to back 10s keep the score respectable. But the mountain is just too high to climb. Iran's Omid Taheri puts his name on the map after upsetting Rio Wild at Alexander Dombayev and forcing Sebastian Peno to shoot a perfect score to beat him, this newcomer on the world scene takes a world title home from Turkey. Hi, today I will be explaining something about your stabilization system. I would start with a ratio from one to three on your stabilization system. So that will mean one up front and three on the back. For a beginner, uh, with, the, with the one to three ratio, you could add up weight until you can still hold your bow and still aim the way you want. When you see your dot moving, uh, for example, when you are aiming in the middle and you will see your dot moving up, you will have to lose weight from the back. And it's the other way around when you, when you have a dot that's moving towards, uh, towards the lower side of, your, of the target. Then you will add weight to your stabilization system. You can see that your bow is a little bit of a pivot in your hand. The trick is with your stabilization system is to add weight and lose weight. And you can do it within four or with, uh, with one ounces or even half ounces. So um, I would suggest buy some more weights and, and try it. On the other hand, it was another nail-biter in the men's team bronze medal match between France and Russia, all even after four ends at 2.31 apiece. To the tiebreaker we go. After a nine by Pinot, Delobel fares no better. The Russians can take command, but they do not. So the fate of France falls into the rather large hands of Jean-Philippe Bouche, who sticks her right on the line. It's a good shot, but is it good enough? Alexander Dombayev's got a golden opportunity, which vanishes in a red ring. Technically, that counts as a nine, but it might as well have been miles from where he needed to be. Bulsh comes up big for France.
Sebastian's day just getting started. The top-ranked man in compound got top billing on the marquee of his gold medal match against second-ranked Mike Schlosser. The 22-year-old Dutchman had dazzled during the week of qualifying and eliminations, at one point reeling off a string of 43 consecutive tens. Both men capable of shooting a perfect score at any time. We'll pick up the action after the first three ends. Both archers three-point shy up, perfection at this point, and tied at 87. Schlosser starts off with another nine. A signal for Peno that it's time to pounce, and pounce he does, moving ahead by one. Schlosser answers the way you'd expect a former world champion to respond. X marks his spot. Of course, Peno is not inclined to give ground, so the lead stays at one. Mike stays in hot pursuit. Tailing Sebastian Peno by a single point after Sebastian runs the table in the fourth end, keeping Schlosser at bay. There's no more margin for error in a match this tight with just three arrows to go. Peno leading 117 to 116, heading to the fifth and final end. As is his custom, Mike Schlosser casually leans back into the shot and then lets it rip right into the 10 ring. Pay no, not about to budge one inch. Now some thought Mike's next shot was in the middle, but others weren't so certain. It went on the board as a 10-9 liner. Correction appears to be However, there was no debate about Peno's next attempt. It was a nerve-wracking nine. For all anyone knew, the match could have been tied. Mike Schlosser could not be sure either, so he did what comes naturally, shoot another 10. Now, theoretically, a 10 would give the gold to Peno. That could be his only assumption since there was still some question about his opponent's second shot. But why take chances? Well, maybe because everyone enjoys a good shoot-off. Made possible because Schlosser's second shot was indeed deemed to be a nine. Had it been a 10 or had Peno posted a 10 on his final shot, well, the match would have been over. But once in a while, you gotta work overtime. So everyone settled back for a one-arrow, winner-take-all shoot-off between the two best men in the compound business. But even the best can have a hiccup. Mike hiccuped first, Sebastian hiccuped second. But his hiccup wasn't as pronounced as Schlosser's. Far from perfect, Peno's shot was undeniably closer to the center, and that was good enough to get the job done. In his first World Championship final, Sebastian Peno caps off an intense week that pit him against Patrick Larson and Omi Taheri, a week when he'd have to beat the man known as Mr. Perfect. Through it all, Sebastian Peno survived all the slings and arrows, shot a perfect score along the way, and was able to grind out a victory in the gold medal match, winning his shootoff with Mike Schlosser by virtue of a nine that was just a bit better. It was really a tight match. I started really stressed out, even though I had the advantage of shooting on the field for the team match. I tried to manage my stress as much as I possibly could. It was tight until the last arrow. I knew I could be a world champion by shooting a 10 with my last arrow, but my sight remained completely locked on the 9. So we had to go to the shoot-off. I had a nine. Not very pretty, but it was closer. And of course, we're getting closer to the Outdoor World Cup season, which begins in April along the banks of the Wangpu River in Shanghai. Oh, my God. 
Thank you.